Um, sorry if my I had some technical difficulties there. If we're ready for Dr. Rosa Cunha, I am. Dr. Weiss, are we ready? Yes, please introduce the speaker. Excellent. Right. Sorry about the delay. So it's my honor to introduce Dr. Isabella Rosa Cunha. She's an associate professor in the Department of Medicine here at the Miller School. She attended medical school at the Universidad Federal de Rio de Janeiro in Brazil and completed internal medicine residency, a fellowship in infectious disease, and a subfellowship in special immunology at Jackson Memorial Hospital. She has been on faculty here in the Division of Infectious Diseases since completing her training. During her fellowship, she conducted the first pilot project in South Florida, evaluating the feasibility of screening for anal dysplasia in HIV-infected individuals. Dr. Rosa Cunha founded the Anal Dysplasia Clinic at Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center, and she is the PI for the Anal Cancer HSIL Outcomes Research, or ANCHOR study, on which she will be presenting today. She is the recipient of 10 federal grants, has authored five book chapters, and published over 40 peer-reviewed articles and abstracts. It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Rosa Cunha to Grand Rounds to discuss her work in anal cancer prevention. Thank you, Andrew. And thanks, uh, everyone, uh, for attending. I'm, I'm really happy to have a chance to talk about not only about the study, but anal cancer prevention. It's a very, it's a relatively new field in medicine. And hopefully at the end, you're going to feel that's meaningful. And you are probably going to recognize that many patients that you follow may be at increased risk for anal cancer. It's a short presentation, so I'll try to keep within 20 minutes or so, so we have time for questions at the end. Before I get to the study per se, I want to set the grounds, uh, sharing some background information that led to this study. I will talk specifically about the anchor study, the implications of this study for our clinic practice in future directions. So I want to start with an overview of anal cancer. It's actually a disease that is not common, affecting around 2% of the general population. However, the incidence has been trending up in the last several years and mortality is going up as well. So if you see here in the US, uh, from 2014 to 2020, you're going to see the new cases have increased. Uh, however, still a small number compared to other malignancies. But if we look at the specific groups, it's a totally different story. And you're going to see that many patients, not only HIV, but other patients are at much increased risk. So I want you to pay attention to the line where we have an incidence of 25 over 100,000. So I, we, I said that the general population is 2%, but let's make it much more dramatic. Let's go to 25 over 100,000 and see who will be around this line for a higher incidence. So when we talk about men, uh, we want to know about their risk for anal cancer. Looking at HIV, you can see here that very early on, when they're 30 or between 30 and 40 years of age, the incidence of anal cancer in this group of gay men HIV infected is extremely high. And if they're HIV negative, it's still quite high. If they're 30, you see around 30 years old. So if they are approaching 40 years of age, the incidence is quite significant. So forget about the 2% for certain group of patients. When we are talking about women, well, before women, go back here to straight men, HIV positive, and you're gonna see here that they are above, early on in life, in their early studies, they are already above for the incidence, 25 over 100,000. So if you are uh, the gay man, you're in, the incidence is high, you are at increased risk, especially HIV, but if you're a straight man, if you're HIV positive, your risk is quite high. Now let's move to women. When we talk about women, uh, let's go here with HIV first. And if, they, if you are a woman, and if you're over, especially over 40 years of age, especially at 45 or older, your risk of anal cancer is quite significant. If the women, HIV negative now, if they have vulvar disease, even pre-cancer, that is the high-grade disease, or vulvar cancer, their risk of anal cancer is much higher than the general population. At no, here is not related to age, is related to the time of the vulvar disease diagnosis. Now I want to talk about the different group here of patients, the patients who are 
non-HIV immunosuppressant. We follow a lot of those patients at our center. We are a large center for transplant. We have a lot of uh, uh, clinics that follow patients with uh, lupus, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease. And you can see here, for example, solid organ transplant after 10 years of immunosuppression, their risk of anal cancer is much higher than the general population. So we know most of the data are coming from HIV individuals, but a lot of other uh, groups are at risk as well. And we see a lot of those patients here. Okay, so before I go to the anal cancer prevention uh, program leading to anchor study, we need to talk, we must talk about cervical bottom uh, because that's where all the uh, uh, techniques for the anal cancer prevention come from. Anal and cervical cancer are very similar disease. They're both caused by HPV and they are preceded by the high-grade famous intrapithelial lesion that we call high seal or high-grade disease. So it's the same histologic disease. HPV can cause nothing, can cause low-grade changes, and then can cause high-grade changes and invasive disease if you, if you progress. So we know that the cervical high-grade can be found if you look for it, and it can be treated and it can prevent the cervical cancer. Why can we do the same for the anal cancer? There was, up, up until the anchor study, there was no uh, data proving that treating high cancer would prevent anal uh, uh, cancer. So the idea of treating, finding high-grade disease in the anal canal, treating, uh, you could use the same technique I'm gonna show to you but there are some things that may be different from the cervix. When you do the treatment for the cervical high grade, when you do the leap, you transect the cervix. So you get rid of an entire session of the cervix. We cannot do that with the anal canal or even the perianal area. So that's a limitation because if you have a lot of disease of multifocal disease, you may not be able to treat appropriately. Uh, you may miss lesions. Remember in the anal canal, you may have prolapse, hemorrhoids, so other things that may be on your way to find the lesions or to treat the lesions appropriately. And certainly we find frequently the guacamole effect that you treat one area and then suddenly when you follow up in a few months or in a year or so, you find uh, something else in a different position of the anal canal. So those are certain limitations that certainly uh, shows that it's not, it's a similar disease, but not the same. The other thing that I think that in the beginning was a concern was that, okay, in the general population, not many people were affected. And most of the disease, when you find is localized, and so the five-year survival is quite high. But what we need to keep in mind that even when you find early disease, remember that what we want to propose is a prevention to find the high grade and treat. When you find cancer, even if it's very early, the classical treatment is chemoradiation. And if any of you have seen or follow patients who have received radiation to the anal area, pelvic area, the morbidity is quite, uh, can be quite dramatic. So we're talking about certain patients who are very uh, young, who have a disease that can be cured, but they may leave with uh, uh, consequences of the treatment. So this, this was something that Led because a lot of the cancers, when we talk about prevention for uh, prostate cancer, uh, from uh, breast cancer, we diagnose cancer early on. What we want to propose here is to intervene even before in the pre cancer stage. All right, so what is the program? It's entirely inspired in the cervical uh, prevention program. So we call high resolution endoscopy uh, the Basically, what it is, is a colposcopy of the anal canal, where we use a coposcope, that is a microscope, that we can look at the perianal and the anal canal. Before we even start talking about pap smear or the high-resolution anoscopy, we must talk about digital rectal exams. We have very few programs on high-resolution anoscopy, and if you don't have access to it, all you're left with the digital rectal exam that can certainly diagnose early cancer. We're not talking about the pre-cancer, but certainly the anal, uh, anal cancer. So you need we, that's how you start the, the, the exam, with a good digital rectal exam. 
After that, we collect the anal swab. So we, it is blind because the studies have shown that when you collect like this without the scope, is actually you, you can actually collect a better, uh, you can sample better the cells. Uh, and the idea is that you go a few inches inside and you come out in circular mode during 50 seconds or so that you, you want to collect cells of the transformation zone and throughout the canal because the disease may not be limited to the transformation zone. It may go through the canal and perineal area. So uh, after we do the path, we are going to put some lidocaine gel and introduce the anoscope. Here, the anoscope is going in. And when the autoscope is in, that's our loop. So that is, uh, I'm gonna play again. So that's a live motion. That's exactly what it is. You go inside and then you can magnify up to 25 times uh, your vision. And when you look, you're gonna see the canal for the ones who are familiar with colposcopy. It doesn't look too different. And you're gonna use acetic acid or vinegar to enhance the transformation zone. That is the trans is the uh, transition between the columnar and the squamous epithelium, and of course you're going to look not only at the transformation zone level but throughout the canal coming out of the canal. And here to illustrate what it is that we look at when we talk about high grade precancer lesions, that is a precancer lesion. So this is very subtle. That is totally microscopic, cannot be seen through a colonoscopy because a lot of patients, they come, oh, I'm updated with my colonoscopy. Uh, I do digital rectal exams. I do the colonoscopy. But that's what we are talking about. So there is no way you can find that uh, without the microscope. So we are here, I show you already the vinegar, the acetic acid look before, and here with the iodine, that's a negative iodine area, and that's a high-grade disease. So that's what we are looking at. Some patients may have very localized disease, some patients may have widespread disease. And here, when we talk about the treatment, that's all it is, is a cauterization of the lesion. So again, remember that with the leap I mentioned, you transect, here we go zapping the area, and that's here, you will use a high fricator or an electrocauterization here. So that's all it is, no rocket science, very simple, but uh, there was so far a potential anchor, there was no proof that they would prevent cancer, and there were very few places offering this type of screening. So we come now to the anchor study. So we know you can find high grade, you can treat high grade, but we haven't proved that it will make any difference whatsoever. So it is a study that comes with the hope to bring information and for the first time and probably the only time to follow the natural history of anal cancer where patients with high grade were followed um, with or without treatment. I explained to you now. So the aim of the study was first to determine if treating high grade disease is effective in reducing anal cancer in patients living with HIV. So this study was meant for patients in living with HIV, because again, that's where most of the data come from. That's the larger group of people affected by anal cancer. We wanted to know if it was safe. We, even if it worked, it wouldn't be worth doing if people cannot tolerate the treatment. We also wanted to understand quality of life. And there was a, the last component of this study was the opportunity to collect the specimens and thousands or millions of specimens that we collected every six months that could help us to identify host and viral factors in high-grade progression and also biomarkers that can uh, hopefully help us to understand high-grade uh, progression to cancer. And we really feel that cervical cancer will also benefit from the information from the study since of course it's not acceptable to follow patients with high-grade cervical disease and watch them to uh, without any kind of treatment. That is the schema of the study. So any patient infected with HIV 35 years or older would qualify for this study. So we would be eligible for a screening. And the ones who we find high grade, we would then enroll in the study. And the patients with high grade would be randomized to active monitoring where they have high grade and they are monitored or they would be treated and monitor, and the endpoint would be cancer. Uh, 
we need the two in row. I show you the methods. Uh, we need the two in row uh, based on the power calculation for this study. 5,058 people with high grain. For that, we need to screen thousands of patients. But that's what we needed to prove our point. So it was a very audacious project to begin with because we were talking about thousands of patients to be screened. Very few people knew how to do the, uh, the procedure. So there was a major preparation for this study. So here, just to share with you, I will go briefly because we have a short time for the presentation, but that's where we came up to the 5,000 people with high grade to need to be found. So we would have to, uh, around 2,500 per arm to detect 31 cases of anal cancer. So that's where we started from. So it was a very large project. There were 15 sites. And um, we were one of the sites and we were within the top enrolling sites in the country. So we really, our patients, uh, they made a huge contribution to this study. So I will, this is a busy slide, but that's the schema of the treatment. I would just explain for the patients who were treated, they could be treated as long, they would come and they, people come for the screening visit if they have high grade, they will come for a second visit for the enrollment. At that visit, they will be randomized. And if they are randomized into treatment, the treatment is started right there. It could be high frication. So ablation, that will be high frication or infrared or topical with the 5 fluoroseal or imiquimod. Usually we use uh, ablation, high frication, infrared for more localized disease. The topical we usually use for patients who had a more widespread disease, and it was also allowed to do combination therapy. So you can you can treat with the cream if it is too ex too extend. Later on, you can hyphricate or, or the opposite depends. So you can use different strategies. So the idea of this study is it was to be very similar to real life, to screen, and if you're going to treat, to do like you do in real life, allowing the provider. So we are not studying here the mode of treatment. We are studying if treatment works or not, just to make it clear. All right, so in the treatment group, you treat them at the enrollment and they will come, everyone, regarding of the, the uh, so the idea for the arms will be you enroll treatment or monitoring and everyone would come every six months where they would have their usual high resolution anoscopy that we do for patients who have high grade anyway, and they would collect their pap smear, they would have the anoscopy, and then for the study, they would have a series of swabs and blood every six months. For the ones in the treatment group, the idea that you want to exterminate high grade. So you treat as many times as needed, like in real life, you give your first shot for the treatment, and it may be enough, 50% of the time, they need more treatment than just one treatment, and again, extends disease needs a series of treatment. The monitoring arm has a very similar schema for follow-up and collection of samples. The difference is that there was no treatment. They would just come and would observing them. And every year you would, uh, if there was any high grade still, uh, you would biopsy every year. We screened 10,723 people from September 2014 to August 2021. For the people that become, from, from among those 10,000 plus people, 4,459 were identified with high grade. In the group who had high grade qualifying for that moving forward in the study, among all the men screened, 53 had high grade. Among all the women screened, 47% had high grade. Just for us to see, how common high grade is found in patients living with HIV. And the transgender, although it was a small group, there was 280 transgender individuals in the, in the study, 67% had high grade. So is that quite, so having pre-cancer, just to recap, having pre-cancer is very common among patients with HIV. And if you want to know the incidence of anal cancer among this group of thousands of patients that we see, 17 patients had anal cancer at the time of screening, so they were excluded, but an incidence of 160 over 100,000. So again, it may not be a disease 
that has significance in the general population, but depending on the group you're studying, it may be quite dramatic. So if you're talking about HIV for sure, and we may extrapolate that for other groups at risk. So keep this in mind, because I don't think that there is too much awareness of the you know, cancer risk among patients, uh, not only living with HIV, but other groups as well. All right, so here I share with you some demographics of the patients who are randomized. So he's not for the entire study, he's for the patients with high grade. And one thing we were very happy in the study that you're gonna see that both arms they're very balanced in terms of demographics. So we are comparing apples with apples. And that, I think that's major, correct? So we were very happy with the, the balance among the groups. You're going to see here the median age was 51. Uh, you have a, a larger group was of men. Uh, here, uh, you can see the distribution of rate, race, ethnicity. Uh, Several of the men, they were gay men. One thing that's important for you to notice that most patients, they were in care with undetected viral load and a pretty good T cell count. So we are talking about the disease that will affect our patients living well in care with HIV, with very controlled disease, all right? However, keep in mind that a lot of those people they were at some point, or they are AIDS, because at some point they have a, a low T-cell count. And we believe that when your T-cell count is low, although you may recover the quantity, quality may not be the same. And also, if at that point your T-cell count is low, you're already infected with HPV, the changes may be there already. And even if you have quantity recovery, the change at the level of the cell level may be already settled. The other thing we wanted, we wanted to know was the extent of the disease, because could it make a difference that if you have more high grade, you are at higher risk? So anyway, we also divided the group among the ones with more than 50% of the anal canal affected by dysplasia and less than 50%. So that's the general characteristic. In terms of the treatment offer, most of the patients when they were treated, again, we are evaluating not the mode of treatment, but we evaluate treatment works or not. Most of the patients, they were treated with what we call ablation, electrocautery, the hyphrication, very simple technique, very similar to the hyphricators that they have in dermatology clinic. And uh, most of the time, uh, patients have one modality, but again, we, were, uh, we have the same uh, capability as we have in real life to, to mix the, the modalities of the treatment. What happened was that the study was meant to follow patients for five years up until the last patient enrolled with the number that we have in mind, the 5,058. The study was terminated earlier on when there were 32, remember the powers for 31 cases of cancer. When there were 32, the data safety monitoring board was then notified. 30 cases were used for analysis because two cases were diagnosed too early, so they were felt that they were missing cases. They were already existed upon enrollment. And what we found was in the treatment group, there were nine participants with invasive anal cancer versus 21 in the active monitoring. So there was a statistic significance. So it was felt the study had met statistical maturity, and it was then uh, terminated with the result that there was a reduction of 57% in anal cancer in the treatment arm. So the cancer incidence in the treatment arm was 173 over 100,000 versus 402 over 100,000 in the monitoring arm. Here I share with you the couple of my curve of this study. You can see here the treatment versus the active monitoring. I'm not Unfortunately, I will try to, I will need to move uh, forward because we don't have too much time. Then the here I share with you, Camilla, some, some statistical calculation after we found. So the main finding is the 57% 57 reduction. But here I share with you some other numbers. Cumulative progression to cancer at 48 months. So not too long of a time. 0 0.90 treatment arm and 1.8 in the monitoring arm. And the cancer risk here, I mentioned to you the extent of the disease. Cancer risk was 185 of 100,000 uh, for the 
for more localized disease versus 1,047 over 100,000 for more extensive disease. I want to share with you here a picture of what we call progression. So you can you see that yet we're talking about very early disease and that's another thing. If you diagnose, even if you're going to develop cancer, it may still be quite early. So that's a progression. So you see here, that's a high grade that progress to cancer. Here, some now for the group who develop cancer, so we look at this column here, we want to know who they are, some of the characteristics, middle age 52. Uh, the group mostly were men, MSM. You can see most of the patients with good control of their HIV. You see here the viral load in the T cell. However, 70% of the people who had cancer at some point had a low T cell count. You see here, uh, the amount of disease was not a determinant here. So, and here, what I mentioned before, although some people develop cancer, they were under watch. Those people were coming every six months in both groups. And you see that most of the disease was stage one. That makes a difference, especially if it's minimally invasive, you don't need chemo radiation. Studies have shown that already. And the study showed that high resolution endoscopy and treatment is quite safe. There are a lot of adverse events in those thousands of patients. One minute, one minute, Dr. Rosa. Minute, sure, going forward. But very few were adverse events related to the study and all, very few severe. And you can see not any, no, nothing not life-threatening. So the recommendation that the SMB stop study, offer treatment to all patients in the study, of course, the ones in the monitoring arm, but we are allowed to continue to follow those patients up until next year. So we, the, the implications of this study, rate of progression for nano high CO2 cancer is high, the treatment is effective, and the data should guide protocols and, and guidelines for the treatment of you know, high grade. CDC is already come studying all the results and will come up with the recommendations for uh, screening of you know, high grade and treatment in patients living with HIV. And also the International you know, Neoplasia Society will publish guidelines, not only for uh, screening or you know, cancer prevention programs for patients living with HIV, for other patients at risk. We screen over 10,000 patients. Here, the need to screen Compared to cervical, I will move forward here so we can finish. We need to finish up, Dr. Sure. Room for improvement because we can do better than 57%. We can find biomarkers with the thousands of samples we have. And of course, the extrapolation to other risk groups. What we do, that's the last slide. While we wait, why in the short term, we want to do digital rectal exams to all patients at risk, including patients with HIV. And we propose to screen patients that living with HIV is starting at the age of 35, and don't forget HPV vaccination, and there is still more to come. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Osakuna, for that very clear uh, and interesting presentation. Uh, we don't have really a lot of time, but I think your last bullet point was probably one of the more important ones, and that is primary prevention is going to win more lives and save more lives perhaps than uh, the secondary prevention, unless you disagree with that, given the fact that the tech, the uh, sophistication of the uh, anoscopist needs to be somewhat, uh, they need to be trained in order to be able to do this, and it's not available necessarily for everybody. You're clearly an expert and your team are experts in doing this, which is amazing. But um, would you agree that primary prevention still is the most important thing? Absolutely. And I think if anyone has more interest in the field, feel free to reach me. Thank you so much for that great presentation. We really appreciate it. Dr. McBride, please introduce our next speaker. It is my honor to introduce Dr. David Kerman, an associate professor in the Division of Gastroenterology of the Department of Medi Medicine with us here at the Miller School. He attended medical school at the University of Texas Health Science Center in Houston and completed internal medicine residency and a year as chief resident at Rush University in Chicago. He joined us in Miami for his fellowship in gastroenterology and has been on faculty here since finishing his training. 
Dr. Kerman has published 53 peer-reviewed journal articles and book chapters, and currently sits on the editorial boards of three journals, including the Journal of Crohn's and Colitis and the Inflammatory Bowel Disease Journal. His academic work further includes 14 clinical trials, of which he has been the principal or primary investigator for nine. His recent contributions include trials focusing on fecal micro microbiome transplantation and Clostridium difficile infections. He has served as the program director for the Gastroenterology Fellowship at UMJMH and is the chief medical officer for the Department of Medicine. It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Kerman to Grand Rounds to discuss his work on recurrent C. diff infections and microbiome-based therapeutics. Thank you so much, Andrew. Thank you to the Department of Medicine for uh, this opportunity. Um, we can get going here and talk about uh, recurrent C. diff infection um, and microbiota-based therapeutics. Uh, these are my disclosures. Um, today, so we're going to talk a little bit about uh, an update on um, C. difficile infection, how you diagnose it, and the current treatment recommendations of the uh, Infectious Disease Societies, as well as the American College of Gastroenterology. Um, we're going to touch on an important topic of colonization versus infection, and how you can really tell the difference uh, between the two, because that has a lot of uh, implications for treatment. Um, and then what are the indications and efficacy of intestinal microbi microbiota transplantation? This is the new uh, moniker that we like to use. It's a little more palatable than fecal microbiota transplantation, but I use both uh, in this presentation. So what are the indications and efficacy for IMT in uh, C. difficile infection? We're going to talk a little bit about inflammatory bowel disease. And then we're going to talk about the newer FDA-approved options um, at the end of the talk. So Clostridioides difficile, which was recently uh, changed uh, in terms of its name and its taxonomy by the CDC a few years ago from Clostridium to Clostridioides difficile, um, is a gram-positive spore-forming organism with, uh, uh, that is spread through the fecal oral route. It's non-invasive. And then there are virulent and non-virulent forms. <clears throat> We're going to focus on the forms that produce the exotoxin uh, A and B. The toxin negative strains are non-pathogenic and actually can confer some protection against uh, C. difficile. Um, and then you've all heard of the B1, NAP1, O27 strain uh, over the last 15, 20 years, which has emerged as the more virulent strain in the United States, which does produce a higher uh, level of toxin um, and does have a higher level of resistance. So looking at this slide here, it shows the um, United States burden of infection over the last uh, uh, decade plus. Um, and if you look at it, it's, we had in 2011 about 500,000 cases uh, annually. That has actually decreased thanks to um, improvement in infection control. Um, but if you actually dive a little deeper, let's see here, um, you see that over those six, over that six year period, those infections have actually changed from healthcare associated to more of a community acquired infection. Whereas in 2011, about 35% of all infections were um, community acquired and 64% were healthcare associated infections. And more recently, we have a higher incidence of community acquired infections and even those infections that are not necessarily associated with antibiotics. And this has caused a lot more problems in some of our more recurrent infections. Um, looking at uh, what I mentioned earlier of the B1 NAP1027 strain from uh, VA data over the, over the from 2017 over to 2020, that also has actually decreased. Um, the darker shaded areas are areas of higher incidence um, in the country in 2017 on the upper left. And then as you move uh, forward in time to the lower right in 2020, um, there's much less incidence of this hypervirulent strain. Nevertheless, we are seeing uh, a tremendous rise in the recurrence of C. difficile infection, and we'll talk about some of the reasons why. Um, this is a very important infection that uh, affects um, all of our outpatients and uh, hospitalized patients as well within the Department of Medicine and all divisions. Um, there the just an index episode has a very high rate of sepsis and even colectomy. And as you get 
higher uh, recurrent episodes, um, first, second, and third recurrence, those rates go go much, much higher. Um, here at uh, University of Miami, we take care of a lot of patients with inflammatory bowel disease. Um, and in particular, patients that have inflammatory bowel disease are at higher risk of, uh, of acquiring C. difficile infection. Um, and, and having C. difficile infection is a marker for more severe disease because of the dysbiosis um, and does confer a risk, an increased risk of colectomy, specifically in ulcerative colitis. So looking at the natural history, uh, a quick review, um, you uh, start with a hospitalized or nursing home patient with some kind of exposure to C. diff, and about 15 to 30 percent of those patients will actually uh, go on to uh, be an asymptomatic carrier state, which is uh, what becomes a vector for uh, transport to other patients. So now give some of those patients altered uh, gut flora by uh, antibiotic exposure, um, or if they're elderly, which can cause altered gut flora, if you're immune compromised, um, again, also caused, causing altered gut flora, then you develop C. difficile associated diarrhea, which is defined as greater than or equal to three loose stools in a 24 hour period. This can range anywhere from a mild diarrhea to a, a more moderate colitis or more severe pseudomembranous uh, colitis um, with, with uh, other consequences. The carrier state is uh, found in abundance uh, amongst us. Um, almost 80% of infants are carriers. And I've had lots of patients that uh, after um, their, uh, they or their spouse has um, a child and they are immune compromised, uh, given that I see a lot of inflammatory bowel disease, they come in and, uh, and end up getting a C. difficile infection. So it's, um, it, it's important to think about these, um, these uh, carrier states and where they are. So it's been found on shoe swabs, soil, household services. Um, in terms of non-hospitalized healthy adults, there's a five to 15% rate of colonization. Um, and amongst hospitalized and nursing home patients, as I said earlier, up to 30% of, of those patients can have colonization. Um, as I mentioned before, asymptomatic carriage of the organism does confer protection against future infection, uh, but they can spread toxigenic strains and infect others. And so that's why it's so important in a hospitalized setting that these patients, um, that we have uh, contact precautions um, and some private rooms for those patients that do uh, have um, asymptomatic carriage. Transmission is from person to person, healthcare workers with exposed hands and clothing, even from animal to person, um, from the environment to people. Um, there is a uh, low incidence of foodborne uh, transmission somewhat higher in the United States than in Canada, uh, um, and it, it, higher in the United States and Canada than in Europe, uh, though overall this is somewhat of a low incidence. Um, and the issue is that this is a spore-forming organism that has resistance to gastric acidity, um, and there is controversy over whether or not there's an increased risk of infection if on a PPI, um, and we'll talk about that in a second. So who gets infected? Obviously, the, the most common are those with uh, recent antibiotic use, um, the elderly, um, inpatients especially are the ones that are going to get infected. Um, and I do want to point out that alcohol-based gels do not uh, fully clean the spores from, uh, from your hands. And so you do need to use good old-fashioned soap and water. Um, the immune-compromised patients are IBD patients, uh, post-transplant patients, and as I mentioned, peripartum patients. And then we're seeing more and more, as I mentioned earlier, normal healthy individuals with no prior antibiotic exposure. The CDC does have cleaning recommendations for their surfaces in terms of what types of products to use uh, with specific uh, C. diff sporcidal label claiming uh, 5,000 uh, parts per million chlorine containing cleaning agents. Um, it's important that we use the right agents. So um, regarding proton pump inhibitors, uh, there, like I said, there's been some controversy um, and in terms of whether or not they actually confer a risk um, because of the decreased acidity in the, uh, in, the, in the stomach, does that increase your risk of uh, more distal enteric infection, specifically C. diff? This was a uh, population-based case control study out of the, out of the uh, UK, um, published in JAMA in 2015, that did show 
a, uh, an association of PPIs with community acquired infections. Um, this next study was looking at uh, inpatients that were actually randomized um, to pantoprazole versus placebo. Um, and the only uh, adverse event that actually did show uh, some significance, or uh, I'm sorry, that, that was, uh, that did show up was C. difficile. However, it was only in a uh, small percentage, was not clinically significant. Um, and ultimately, the ACG guidelines recently published suggest against the discontinuation of any anti-secretory therapy in patients with C. difficile infection, um, provided there is an appropriate indication for their use. This was a strong recommendation, how, albeit with very low quality of evidence. So I would just mention that um, for all of your patients on PPIs, just make sure you have an appropriate indication. And I would suggest lowering uh, the dose to the lowest possible um, uh, dose that would uh, that is effective for your patients. Um, and those patients that are at risk that could potentially use H2 receptor antagonists that may be better, but again, the, the ACG guidelines don't really recommend um, discontinuation of these uh, in patients uh, at risk or even with C. difficile infection. So the laboratory tests, I think, are very important to review uh, to understand uh, the difference between colonization and infection. Um, and we use the multi-step algorithm here uh, at the UM Jackson uh, campus, which starts with the uh, glutamate dehydrogenase antigen which uh, tests for the Clostridium antigen produced by both toxigenic and non-toxigenic strains. It's very cheap and it's highly sensitive, but not very specific for the disease. The next step is the toxin assays, the ELISA immunoassays, um, some of which test only for the A toxin, some of which test for B, and some of which test for both. And then there's the uh, nucleic acid amplification test, the, the, the PCR test that tests for the gene for toxin B, which is um, can be done in real time, is very expensive, um, but can be quick um, and questionable in terms of whether or not it's accurate. So this is our algorithm that we have here, um, which uh, if you have a GDH test that is positive and a toxin test that is positive, then you have a positive infection. Um, if you have a GDH test that is positive, but a toxin test that is negative, it will reflex to the nucleic acid uh, amplification test. And if that PCR test is positive, um, then you have to decide whether or not somebody is actually colonized versus um, an actual infection. So this was a study uh, done in California um, looking at uh, looking at um, patients uh, in, a, in a hospital that um, had investigators uh, look at whether patients were uh, GDH and toxin positive, but then they would blind the, um, uh, the, the physicians taking care of these patients to the PCR test. So all they had was the GDH and the toxin available to them. And what they showed was, was that regardless of what the PCR test showed, um, diarrhea resolved in all of these patients at a two-week period. So um, even if you had a GDH positive, toxin negative, and then PCR positive test, those patients were not treated with any antibiotic therapy, and they went on to have resolution of their diarrhea within a 14-day period. Um, patients that were GDH positive and toxin positive were treated had the same outcome. So this, this, this brings up the notion that some of these patients that are ELISA toxin negative, but PCR positive may not necessarily have infection, may have some other uh, reason for diarrhea and may in fact be colonized rather than actually having a true infection. So this is where the multi-step algorithm really is up for interpretation and uh, it is important to really look for other causes of diarrhea in addition to even somebody that has been previously treated for C. difficile infection. The PCR test can remain positive up to six to eight weeks after, um, after uh, therapy. So recurrent infection, which is the big problem nowadays, um, is defined as a recurrence of C. difficile infection within an eight-week period following completion of therapy um, from prior C. difficile infection. Just having, just having the uh, 
uh, an initial index case of C. difficile infection um, has about a 10 to 20 percent risk of a recurrence. And after you have one recurrence, you have a 40 to 60 percent risk of having further recurrences. So who is it that gets recurrent infection? Obviously, those with prior episodes, those that are immune compromised, recent uh, recurrent antibiotic exposure, older age, and dysbiosis, such as those in an uncontrolled IBD setting. So as I mentioned, um, the toxin can actually stay positive for up to eight weeks following infection and therapy, including intestinal microbiota transplant therapy. And I will often get um, referrals for patients that have a, quote, persistent positive C. diff infection, and they're looking at either the toxin or the PCR test. And I'm here to tell you that we should not be testing to confirm eradication as the toxin and the PCR test, again, remain positive for a, for a very long time. And so based on more symptom complex and, and uh, clinical contact, you should really be basing your decision-making on symptom complex and clinical context. Does this patient have recurrent diarrhea? Do they have leukocytosis? Are they having repeated antibiotic exposure? Um, and do you need to do a, uh, do we need to do an endoscopy to look to see whether or not there are pseudomembranes? Again, there's, uh, you know, you need to think about your um, clinical uh, gestalt and what's going on with the patient to determine whether or not there's really an infection versus a colonization. A lot of these patients that remain positive may in fact have an irritable bowel syndrome that is diarrhea predominant. And this is just a demonstration of two different studies that showed um, a high percentage of patients with C. diff do get irritable bowel syndrome following, following uh, treatment. All right. So regarding treatment, we're going to go over a little bit about what the IDSA and what the ACG guidelines say um, regarding antibiotics. So there's metronidazole, vancomycin, and fidaxomycin. You have the immune-based therapies, um, which we'll briefly touch on. And then the uh, uh, live bio biotherapeutics, which were recently approved by the FDA. So in 2021, the uh, IDSA and SHEA guidelines came out, which actually changed how we think about um, our initial episode and what we should be giving our patients with uh, C. difficile infection. They mentioned that the preferred initial therapy is fidaxomycin for a 10-day course. For the first recurrence, you would repeat fidaxomycin um, and even for the second or subsequent recurrence. Um, and if you have a fulminate uh, with sepsis or ileus, you can give vancomycin via an NG tube. If you gave vancomycin initially, you could, and it worked, then you go with vancomycin again, plus a uh, prolonged taper. Um, and if you have fulminate disease, you can give it via enema. Metronidazole is to be used only if fidaxomycin or vancomycin is not available. Uh, for a first recurrence, um, there's an adjunct therapy of uh, the immune therapy that I'll mention, bezlotuximab, which is an antibody against the toxin B, um, plus standard of care antibiotics. Um, for further recurrences, uh, you can also use a rifaximin uh, taper. Um, if there's a fulminant uh, case, you can use IV metronidazole plus vancomycin. And then for second uh, recurrences, intestinal microbiota transplant is indicated. ACG guidelines differ somewhat in that they separate it into severe and non-severe cases, which is defined as a white count over 15,000 or serum creatinine over 1.5. Um, they say that vancomycin or fidaxomycin for a first occurrence um, is indicated. They don't necessarily prefer fidaxomycin. Um, and we'll talk about uh, the data that IDSA used to determine that, uh, that preference. Again, similar to the IDSA for fulminant uh, cases that um, are severe cases with hypotension or ileus, oral vancomycin via an NG tube, IV metronidazole in conjunction, or if you can give a vancomycin enema, or even they suggest intestinal microbiota transplants for fulminant cases in those cases where you could potentially save, uh, save a person from a colectomy. For recurrence, uh, ACG recommends um, tapering of vancomycin uh, dose um, after initial antibiotic therapy or oral fidaxomycin. So this was the study that the Infectious Disease Society based their preferred uh, recommendation for fidaxomycin over vancomycin as it showed a non-inferiority in initial clinical response to vancomycin 
And additionally, those, those that did respond to vidaxomycin had a lower recurrence rate and a superior sustained rate um, up, to two, up to three months out in this particular study. There is a difference in the antibiotics. And if you look on the right here of vancomycin versus fidaxomycin, particularly on microbiota diversity, whereas vancomycin, I often say, is somewhat of a napalm bomb to the intestinal microbiota, and it really um, sort of wipes out everything in your intestinal microbiome, whereas fidaxomycin has been shown to, to somewhat preserve some of the intestinal microbiome. And perhaps this is why you have this non-inferiority on initial response and also um, uh, less recurrence uh, at, at three months out. I mentioned bezlotuximab, which is an IgG monoclonal antibody to toxin B, very expensive, um, has been shown uh, on a single dose on patients uh, with adjunctive uh, standard of care antibiotic therapy to reduce recurrence. Uh, with a number needed to treat of 10, should be considered for prevention of uh, C. difficile infection um, recurrence in those at higher risk, those being uh, elderly, uh, elderly population, immune compromised, those with severe infection, or those with a second episode within the last six months. This is not on formulary at uh, the tower, but there are some uh, infusion centers uh, in the community that will give it uh, following discharge. And then there's the notion of vancomycin prophylaxis therapy for those patients that just cannot get off of vancomycin. Um, this is appropriate for those patients that are either um, requiring frequent courses of antibiotics uh, and or they, have, um, they are not necessarily a candidate for uh, intestinal microbiota transplantation or they have a failed IMT um, and those with a high risk of recurrence that need systemic antibiotics. Um, I've had patients that essentially stay on a daily dose of vancomycin, and you can taper this out to every other day or every three days, but essentially the lowest possible dose that keeps a patient uh, without um, loose stools. So the problem with antibiotics are that they're effective at killing the toxin-producing vegetative bacteria, but they do not kill the spores that can germinate in uh, and, and hang around um, and particularly can flourish in, in somewhat of a dysfunctional microbiome. And so in order to achieve a sustained clinical response, patients do need some kind of microbiome restoration. Um, there is uh, some data for probiotics, but in general, um, there really is not a role for probiotic therapy in C. difficile infection um, for many reasons. It has very poor regulatory oversight. It's considered a medical food product. Um, there were two trials, one for primary prevention, another for secondary prevention that both showed no difference in the rate uh, of C. difficile infection or C. difficile recurrence um, between uh, uh, the probiotic and the placebo-controlled group. Um, that's further, uh, that notion is furthered by uh, a study that was done out of Israel that looked at um, uh, murine and human models um, that were given antibiotics, um, and they looked at uh, the microbiome post-antibiotic exposure in three different groups, one that got an autologous uh, stool transplant, um, another that got probiotics, and another that got no intervention. And the interesting finding out of this study was that probiotics actually induced a very delayed and incomplete indigenous stool uh, microbiome reconstitution, um, further uh, making it uh, more likely that um, their recurrence of C. difficile infection could, uh, uh, you know, is, 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 is more likely afterwards. So I typically do not use probiotics uh, post, um, post C. difficile infection um, because of, you know, namely the fact that you really don't know what you're giving these, these patients. Um, and I often find that uh, there are some data that, that suggests that the microbiome is really altered by some of not just what they put in it, but some of the inert substances that are actually used to to, to house some of the uh, some of the uh, probiotics. So intestinal microbiota transplantation um, it actually has a long storied history back uh, in the fourth century AD in China, where um, Hong described drinking fecal water uh, as a rescue therapy for serious food poisoning or diarrhea and moving forward into the 1950s, where a surgeon uh, by the name of Eisenman actually used um, uh, fecal enemas um, to treat pseudomembranous colitis successfully. Um, the first uh, report of 
uh, C. difficile infection using frozen fecal mi microbiota transplant uh, microbiota capsules were um, was described in 2012, and we've moved forward uh, now in um, in learning more of, and understanding more about what actually happens pre FMT and post FMT and why uh, intestinal uh, microbiota transplant works. And I'll just kind of move forward. There are different ways that this could be done. You could do it via colonoscopy. Um, I often do this because I do want to get biopsies of the colon, the colonic mucosa to see if there are other things going on, specifically in my IBD patients. Um, the initial uh, randomized control trial was done via NG tube. Um, enemas is now uh, a very safe way to do it. Um, it can be given by frozen capsules and often and also lyophilized capsules. Um, it has been shown to be a durable therapy um, that uh, that the cure rate lasts over three months post uh, IMT. Um, we've been studying this uh, since uh, 2017 in an official registry, um, and this was published um, a couple of years ago that showed uh, that this was the first real world data that showed that uh, intestinal microbiota transplantation was actually um, a, uh, a, a, you know, could be successful and a, and a durable uh, treatment method for recurrent C. difficile infection. We were, uh, you'll notice that Florida is highlighted here. We were one of the uh, sites for this study. One um, minute remaining, Dr. Kerman. Sure. Okay, thank you. So the FDA has not approved of intestinal microbiota transplantation, namely because of the unknown risks that have come up. So what has recently uh, occurred is they have allowed a new um, a new category for live biotherapeutic therapy. Um, the first of which was approved in November of 2022. It was called RBX 2660, the trade name of Rebiota, which is indicated for the prevention of recurrence of infection rather than treatment, um, and it is manufactured. Uh, from qualified donors, um, and it is essentially, it's a one-time enema that is given after therapy, after standard antibiotic therapy uh, is, um, is, is given. Um, this has been shown in uh, several randomized control trials, which we were a part of, uh, to uh, be efficacious. Um, the next uh, therapy, which two weeks or three or four weeks ago was approved by the FDA, uh, uh, sorry, a month ago um, in April, um, is called, uh, this was from a company called Ceres. Um, their product, Cere 109 or Voust, is an encapsulated bacterial spore suspension. Um, again, indicated for prevention of, of uh, recurrent C. difficile infection following antibiotic treatment. It's not indicated for treatment. These are um, capsules that are given following a uh, bowel cleanse uh, uh, for a three-day period. Um, this particularly, uh, this this uses uh, firm acute uh, bacterial spores, um, and they isolate them and lyophilize them. And, I, you know, you better uh, go to your conclusion slide at this point. Doctor. Okay, so SEER 109 has been shown to be efficacious. There's one more that's in the pipeline called Vedanta, which is, uh, which has also been shown to be efficacious. Um, and all of these really raise the question is, what are what are the what is the future of of treatment of recurrent C. difficile infection? Is there something that we could learn from a patient's microbiome that they're missing that is causing uh, these patients to be at risk for recurrent C. difficile infection? Um, and then uh, I'm hoping to have some of these therapies available for our patients uh, in the very near future. So I'm sorry to rush through a lot of that, but it is an exciting time. Uh, the last time I spoke about this, uh, there was no FDA approved medications. So now we actually have something that patients can uh, uh, can have access to, um, and I think can really help uh, with our infection control, both in our outpatient and inpatient population. So thank you very thank much. You, thank you, Dr. Kerman, for their, their very clear and informative presentation. I thank both our presenters today, Dr. Rosa Guna and Dr. David Kerman, for giving us uh, a new insight into infections and how they can inf inf if uh, influence our world. Um, I remind everyone to look in the chat for the link to the CME and MOC, uh, and I look forward to seeing everybody next week. Be well, be safe, and thank you.